Hi everyone, hope you are fine. I'm Dr. Jaffari. Some of my master and PhD students are developing a new finite element to analyze a specific type of modern structures. A common question of them is how we can recognize the degrees of freedom for each node in the new element. And uh, in this video, I I'd like to answer this question. If you want to introduce a new element or if you want to be an expert in the finite element analysis, this video can be helpful. As you know, the finite element method, abbreviated as FEM or sometimes finite element analysis, abbreviated as FEA, is a numerical method to obtain the solution of some problems in physics and engineering. This method discretizes a whole body into an equivalent system of smaller bodies or units, which are called finite elements, and they are interconnected at common points or boundary lines or boundary surfaces to two or more elements. These common points are called nodal points or nodes. In the finite element method, Instead of solving the problem for the entire body, we formulate the equations for each finite element and assemble them to obtain the solution of the whole body. I can say that uh, there are two main methods uh, to recognize the degrees of freedom for each node in an element. The first method is based on the boundary conditions of the whole structure and in the second method, uh, we use the extreme potential energy of the considered element. To be clear, please let me explain these two methods in some specific and simple structures like bar element, beam element, and uh, plate element. And uh, for the beam element, uh, we will discuss about the classical or Euler Bernoulli beam theory and first order shear deformation theory fstt uh, or timoshenko beam theory it's uh, it is uh, another name of the first order shear deformation theory and for the plate element the classical or kirchhoff law theory and also first order or mindlin reisner theory uh, will be discussed to recognize the degrees of freedom for the plate element so as you can understand, uh, totally we discuss about five elements. Uh, we, we discuss about five elements, and I think this completely helps you to understand how one can recognize the degrees of freedom per each node in an element. The considered element can be simple or higher order elements. Likewise, they can be uh, one-dimensional elements or two or three-dimensional elements. For example, this element is a simple element like bar element or beam element, which can be used in one-dimensional analysis. Uh, as you see, um, this element, uh, this simple element, has um, two nodes, one at each end, also. You can see here the higher order element that has two end nodes, one and three, and some intermediate nodes. However, in this element, we have only one intermediate node, number two, but uh, there can be more intermediate nodes as general. A simple rectangular plate element and also a higher order rectangular plate element have been shown here. That, be, that can be used uh, for two-dimensional analysis of plates. And similarly, uh, the simple and uh, higher order three-dimensional elements have been depicted here. It's very important to keep in mind that no matter whether simple or higher order element is used, these two, met these two methods, I mean boundary conditions method and also strain potential energy method, can be used to recognize the degrees of freedom for each node. In the first, in the first method, we named boundary conditioned methods. 
Uh, first, we have to obtain the boundary conditions of the whole structure. You may know that one of the well-known methods to obtain the boundary conditions is the principle of minimum minim, is the principle of minimum potential energy for a static analysis, and the Hamilton's principle for dynamic or vibrational analysis. After employing a suitable method to obtain the boundary conditions, we generally obtain two types of boundary conditions, namely essential or kinematic boundary conditions and natural or kinetic boundary conditions. As it is named, the essential or um, kinematic boundary conditions are related to the kinematics of deformation in the boundaries and the natural or kinetic boundary conditions are related to the kinetics of deformation in the boundaries. In uh, defining the degrees of freedom for each node in the element, in a new element, we have to consider all essential boundary conditions as the degrees of freedom of each node in an element. I want to emphasize that only all essential boundary conditions have to be considered as the degrees of freedom of each node in an element. In the first method, the boundary conditions method, uh, I explained. In the second method, that is the strain potential energy method, first uh, we have to obtain this energy for the element. Then, based on the order of derivatives of variables which uh, appeared in the integrand, in the integrand of the strain potential energy, we define the degrees of freedom for each node. Uh, if the nth order of derivative, um, if the nth order of derivatives of variables are um, appeared in the integrand of the potential energy, then the n minus one order of uh, derivatives of variables have to be considered in the degrees of freedom for each node. In other words, up to one order less than the derivatives of variables in the integrand has to be considered as the degrees of freedom of each node in a simple or higher order element. For instance, consider that we have only one variable w in our analysis. This variable can be, for example, the deflection of the beam element, which uh, you may be familiar with this. If w double prime, uh, I mean the second order of uh, the second order derivative of W appeared in the integrand of the strain potential energy. So we have to consider W and uh, W prime in the degrees of freedom uh, for each node. I mean up to the first order derivative of W have to be the degrees of freedom for each node. The bar structure is shown here. As you know, uh, the bar structure is subjected to the axial load, uh, so it um, deforms mostly in the axial direction. Usually, we use the parameter u as the axial deformation in the bar analysis. In this figure, E is the Young modulus, A is its cross-sectional area, and L is uh, its length. Suppose that we discretize this structure using the simple bar element. Uh, however, I, I'd like to re-emphasize that the degrees of freedom uh, for each node in simple or higher order elements are the same. Now, I'd like to explain how we can recognize the degrees of freedom of each node in this element. At first, we use the first method, that is the boundary conditions method by referring to some references uh, like this book. One can obtain all boundary conditions of the bar. Uh, note that uh, obtaining the boundary conditions for a structure uh, are out of the scope of this video, so I don't explain this issue here. Uh, for the boundary conditions of the bar, um, we can say that at x equals zero or L, at x equals 0 or L, and as the essential boundary conditions, U is specified or from variational viewpoint, the variation of U equals 0 at boundaries. 
for uh, for the natural frequency for the natural boundary conditions uh, i'm so sorry for the natural boundary conditions the internal axial load n uh, will be zero at the boundaries in this equation in this equation uh, and for the internal axial load uh, u prime means the first derivative of u with respect to x then based on the rules i explained before for the first method, uh, the boundary conditions uh, method, I mean, the essential boundary condition, the essential boundary conditions have to be the degrees of freedom for each node. So only the axial deformation U will be the degrees of freedom for each node in the simple or higher order elements of the bar structure. Uh, another point that uh, you may know is that uh, one of the boundary conditions, I mean uh, essential or natural boundary conditions, is satisfied in each boundary. In other words, I mean both boundary conditions will not be satisfied in each end. Let me explain uh, the second method in which we use the strain potential energy. Again, by referring to uh, some references, the strain potential energy of a bar uh, we name uh, U, the strain potential energy we name U, can be written as uh, one half times the integral of Ea multiplied by U prime square. Based on the rules I explained for this method up to one order less than the derivatives of um, variables appeared in the integrand have to be the degrees of freedom of each node. As you can see, the first derivative of u appeared in the integrand and so zeroth order of the derivative, uh, which means the variable itself, has to be the degrees of freedom of each node. As you can see, both methods, both methods uh, have been applied for the bar elements to obtain the degrees of freedom for each node and uh, u is the only degree of freedom for the node in this slide we are going to obtain the degrees of freedom for each node in a beam element the beam structure is shown here uh, it is clear that the beam structure is under the action of vertical load so it deforms mostly in the vertical direction. The parameter W uh, is used as the vertical deformation of the beam, uh, the mid-plane of the beam, I mean. Uh, the same as we had for the bar analysis, E um, is the Young modulus, L is its length, and I uh, is its second moment of area. We discretize the beam structure using the simple element of the beam, you can see here. And uh, for the first method, you can obtain the boundary conditions of the beam as it is presented here. At both ends, uh, W is uh, specified or uh, internal shear force V equals zero. As you know, uh, shear force equals EI multiplied by the third derivative of W. Um, this set is the first boundary conditions and in the beam structure we have two boundary conditions. The second boundary condition is W prime is specified or internal bending moment M equals zero. It is clear that W prime is the slope of the deformed midplane of the beam and uh, the beam the bending moment m equals ei multiplied by the second derivative of w you can understand that uh, these are the essential boundary conditions of the beam and uh, these are uh, the natural boundary conditions of the beam and uh, based on the rules explained before uh, you can realize that W and uh, W prime, all essential boundary conditions, I mean, the W and W prime are the degrees of freedom uh, for each node in the beam element. For the second method, the strain potential energy of the beam is necessary, which is presented here, you can see here. 
as you can see the second derivative of w appeared in the integrand and so uh, using the rules explained before you can realize that uh, w and w prime will be the degrees of freedom for each node in the beam element the timushenko beam is shown here and uh, e is the young modulus g shear modulus i second moment of area a cross-sectional area and l is the beam length and also w is the beams deflection uh, and uh, psi is the bending rotation the boundary conditions of the uh, timushenko beam are presented here at x equals zero and l W is specified or the shear force is zero. The shear force in this theory equals Ks Ag multiplied by Tw Tx minus Psi and Ks is the shear correction factor and also another boundary conditions for the Timoshenko beam is Psi is specified at the boundary or um, the bending moment is zero. The bending moment is EI multiplied by D psi uh, DX. It is clear that um, these are the essential boundary conditions and these are the natural boundary conditions. And therefore, the degrees of freedom for each node in the Timoshenko beam element are the deflection W and the bending rotation psi. For the second method, the strain potential energy for the Timoshenko beam is presented here, as you can see here. U equals one half uh, times uh, the integral of EI um, d psi dx squared plus Ks Ag multiplied by dw dx minus psi squared dx from 0 to Le uh, uh, in which Le is the uh, length of the element and as you can see the first order derivative of W and also first order derivative of Psi uh, appeared in the integrand and so W and Psi are the degrees of freedom for each node in the Timoshenko beam element. For evaluating the classical plate element, let me first review the relations for the bending and twisting moments along with the shear forces. In this figure, Mx and My are the bending moments and Mxy is the twisting moment and also Qx and Qy are the shear forces. Please uh, keep in mind the coordinate system shown here and also look at the planes in which um, these parameters act. As can be seen, um, Mx, Mxy and Qx act on the right plane in which the x-axis uh, is perpendicular uh, to it. Also, My, Mxy and Qy uh, act uh, on the front uh, plane in which the y-axis is perpendicular to it. The relation between the bending moments and also twisting moments and uh, uh, shear forces uh, are presented here. In these equations, um, W of X and Y is a deflection of the plate uh, in the position uh, X and Y. Nu, uh, you can he uh, hear, nu is the Poisson's ratio and D is the bending rigidity of the plate. Also, uh, Vx and Vy are defined as the effective shear forces and they act on the same plane as Qx and Qy act. For the rectangular plate element uh, shown in this slide and based on the classical plate theory, uh, we want to obtain the degrees of freedom for each node. Uh, for boundaries along the x-axis, I mean for x equals uh, 0 and a, 
the first set of boundary conditions is uh, that the deflection w is specified or effective shear force vx equals zero another set of boundary conditions for this edge is partial derivative of w with respect to x is specified or the bending moment uh, mx equals zero it is clear that uh, partial derivative of w with respect to x is the slope of the plate along the x axis similarly for the boundary conditions along the y axis i mean at y equals uh, zero and y equals b the first set of um, boundary conditions is that the deflection w is specified or uh, vy equals zero another set of boundary conditions for this edge uh, is partial derivative of w with respect to y or its slope in the y direction is uh, specified or uh, the bending moment my equals zero it is clear that um, this set is the essential boundary conditions and um, this set is the natural boundary conditions so based on the rules for the boundary conditions method uh, explained before um, we can say that the deflection w and uh, the partial derivative of w with respect to x and uh, also the partial derivative of w with respect to y will be the three degrees of freedom of each node in the plate element based on the classical plate theory in this slide and uh, based on the strain potential energy method we are going to obtain the degrees of freedom for each node in a classical plate element by referring to some related literature the strain potential energy for the plate based on the classical plate theory is presented here as can be seen the second order partial derivative of the w with respect to x and also the second order partial derivative of w with respect to y have appeared in the integrand and so based on the rules for this method one can realize that the deflection w and also uh, its first partial derivative with, with respect to x and also with respect to y uh, are the degrees of freedom of each node in the plate element based on the classical plate theory this is the same as we obtain the degrees of freedom based on the boundary conditions method for the classical plate uh, element in the previous slide for the last element we are going to talk about the plate element based on the first order shear deformation theory or mindling reisner theory um, similar to the classical plate theory we introduce the bending and twisting moments in these equations uh, psi x and psi y are the bending rotations along the y and x axis respectively the same as before the parameters d and also the parameter nu are the bending rigidity of the plate and its Poisson's ratio respectively also the shear forces of the plate in this theory are shown here qx and also qy are the shear forces in the x and y planes respectively ks is the shear correction factor h is the thickness of the plate and g is the shear modulus of the plate moreover w is the plate deflection A similar process as in the classical plate theory has to be done to obtain the degrees of freedom for each node uh, in this theory for boundaries along the x-axis the first set of um, boundary conditions is that the deflection w is specified or um, the shear force qx equals zero another set of boundary conditions for this edge uh, is uh, psi x is specified or the bending uh, moment mx equals zero and the final set of boundary conditions 
for this edge is psi y is specified or the twisting moment mxy equals zero similarly for the boundary conditions uh, along the y-axis the first set of uh, boundary conditions uh, is that w is specified or qy equals zero another set of boundary conditions for this edge is psi x is specified or uh, the twisting moment mxy equals zero and the final set of boundary conditions for this edge is psi y is specified or the bending moment my equals zero um, it is obvious that um, this set is the essential boundary conditions and this set is the natural boundary conditions and so uh, we can say that uh, w and psi x and psi y will be the three degrees of freedom of each node in the plate element based on the um, mean lean reisner plate theory the strain potential energy for the plate based on the FSTT, based on the first order shear deformation theory of the plate, can be obtained as presented here. As can be seen, the first order partial derivative of W with respect to X or Y, and also uh, the first order partial derivative of psi X and psi Y with respect to X and Y, appeared in the integrand and so based on the rules for this method one can say that uh, w psi x and psi y are the degrees of freedom for each node of this element uh, if this video was useful for you please like it and also please recommend it Likewise, please subscribe my channel. I will prepare and upload other videos on this channel uh, in the near future when time permits. Thank you so much for your attention.